You're listening to Enemies of the State. I'm Alex Hoffman, the publisher of Solrad. I'm Dan Nolikin, the editor-in-chief of Solrad. I'm Rob Cloud, the acquisitions editor of Solrad. I'm Jules Bakes, freelance critic. Enemies of the State is a book club podcast featuring a rotating cast of comics critics. This is our third episode with SBX, and this month we're talking about Francis Bacon by Elizabeth Bethea, published by Domino Books in 2021. Uh, ostensibly a comic about Francis Bacon, the figurative painter. Francis Bacon drifts around the ideas of embodiment and the human condition in an unsure future. We're also really pleased to have Elizabeth on the show with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. This Glad is a special here. recorded edition for SVX. Um, Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you a, I'm going to start the conversation with a hard question. So I apologize up front. <laughs> Do you consider uh, Francis Bacon a comic? Do you consider it to be a comic? Mm, yes. Okay. Yes. It's, um, I asked that question yeah. for, for a really, like, because the first thing I asked myself when I was reading it is like, is this a comic? Is this um, illustrated poetry? Is this free form um, prose uh, with, il with illustrations? And I, I think I came after a little coaching from Daniel, who who is uh, who is my uh, my go to on these sorts of questions. Um, I I came around to this idea that absolutely it was a comic, but I wanted to hear your thoughts about how you make um, the work you make, and especially this this specific comic. Uh huh. Well, I think it, it's a comic. I started off making comics, but um, I come from like a poetry background. So I think I always um, aspired to like work more on the writing than maybe most comic creators do. And I don't come from an art background at all, which you might, you know, you might have inferred that from the way that I draw, you know, and I, I have a lot of friends that are artists and I, I say, oh, I'm horrible at drawing and they go, no, your shit is good, you know, and I'm like, you know, I just, I, I always feel like I'm coming from, you know, just a very kind of art brute sort of, you know, like I'm, it's, you know, uh, unrefined and I don't labor much upon them. You know, I will, I mean, I, I actually will, for a very tiny drawing, I will spend a long time, maybe a couple hours on something like that, but I'm not going to draw it over and over again. I'm going to make that little drawing work for me. I'll use white out if I need to. And if if I if it if it doesn't work, you know, just start over. But I'm not going to draw it like ten times, you know. So um, anyway, people want to call my stuff different things. I think I call it like kind of poetic comics, like to people just when I meet them at parties and stuff. But I really don't know what to. Immediately they go to like, oh, you do comics. They think Marvel. They think whatever which is not my thing at all, you know, like I haven't even ever seen a Marvel movie, I don't think. And it's not a snobby thing or it's just like, I'm just not interested, you know? But um, I, uh, some people want to call it like, like I, I had a, com a couple comics um, in Bomb Magazine on their website, which is like kind of a literary arts magazine in New York. And the editor wanted to call it graphic shorts, you know? And I was like, I was like, I call them comics. And she was like, okay, cool. We'll call it that, you know, but it's like, people want to call it whatever they want, you know? So, yeah. Um, they're, they're not just poetry. They're not just, you know, you know, there's some sort of marriage going there that I think is a very old tradition that we can just call comics for, you know, the sake of simplicity. So, yeah. I think, mean, you know, there's, there's certainly this interplay between the, the, <laughs> the what I think finally sells, sold me on the idea of, is it comics? Is it not? And why I even ask this question to begin with is because it's kind of a, it's an interesting one to get at your process and get at the, you know, at the nature of the work. But also I think it really gets at this idea of you have these, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about your work and about this comic in particular is the way that the language bounces off the image sometimes in kind of almost like farcical ways, like, mm -hmm. um, you have this like really serious um, conversation with yourself or with the reader or however you want to think about the text. Um, 
and then there's like uh the, like pictures of of like booze bottles that are like this is horrible you know like there's like little you know like little silly notes on on the items that kind of defray a lot of the uh the gravitas sometimes that you see in in the in the writing is that mm -hmm. is that an intentional thing or is it just trying to make yourself not seem so pretentious or what's the mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's like I'm playing with like, you know, the absurdity of life a lot, you know, and it's so it's like you you have these, I mean, it, you know, tragic comedy, you know, it's mm -hmm. Hamlet, you know, I mean, it's all it's in the book, you know, it's like, yeah. I, I I've been talking with this woman who's like an academic, we've just been like writing a little about Francis Bacon, actually, and, and she was talking to me a lot about how Hamlet is in it. And I was, we were talking about how like books that I read when I was in high school, Make, you know, I think for everyone, things you read when you're young really stick with you in these dumb mm -hmm. ways. And a lot of the stuff that I was introduced to was just like white men feeding me stuff. To, you know what I mean? It was like <laughs> I didn't get to explore a lot of things, you know, but like or something like Hamlet, you know, I read in eighth grade and it really did stick with me as a story on some level, you know, and it's going to show up in my work. But like, I don't have a lot of I don't. It's funny. It's just everything before age 18 is really like always showing up in my work like and things afterwards not as much you know it's like this period of my life anyway but wait i i, I veered away from the original question no i think well one of the, i you kind of got at that answer the answer though or a really interesting idea is this you know just kind of like how this how the stuff kind of how the images kind of play off the text and uh one of the kind of the way that i was thinking about it when i was reading is that the image defrays the text to a certain degree it makes it uh i makes, get what you're saying like I'm, yeah. I'm kind of making it light making light of heavy situations or yeah. something. like here's oh this is actually funny you know but mm. like when i was writing this book i i would read it i mean my drafts and stuff and i would be like jesus christ this is the most depressing book and i seem like i want to kill myself like i would really have like thoughts with myself like no one's gonna want to read this this is like really a bummer you know big bummer but I'm always trying to I think counter it with like the humor and like I like living actually you know what I mean so it's like you know life is just incredibly absurd and I think we went through like with like the Trump presidency and all the, you know we went through this insane period where I think I was like personally just like at the end of my rope with like a lot of humanity you know mm -hmm. And did I had to do a lot of like self evaluation and you know, and then so I wrote a lot of that in that year of sort of like who's going to win the presidency what's how, you know like that's when this it's like my COVID book you know and I got COVID very early on like I don't know one in five New Yorkers did you know yeah. so I got it early on it sucked I had brain fog I, so I wrote this book in a very strange kind of place you know where my body didn't feel good at all like I you know I was just achy. It, when I got the first shot of the vaccine, I was like sick for a day. And then I had like a, like a crazy, like my body came back to me. It was like the most insane, like 30 minute feeling of suddenly I was like, it was like out of my body. It'd been like hanging out in my body, you know? And I, anyway, I think that's what long COVID was. It was just like chilling in people's bodies, but um, that's, that's an aside, but you know, I was very, um, you know, I guess I, I was depressed, you know, and I'm, you know, writing and trying to sublimate that anxiety and depression into art which is you know what anybody that's like what a lot of people the only outlet they have and um you know i ended up with this book which is like really sad but i think really funny and you have to you have to laugh at the tragedies in your life or the thing you know these things i mean you know or you like don't survive i think you know so yeah there's especially with everything that we've been through over the last let's say 20 months or whatever it's been now you know yeah, i think it's yeah. you you had just you know you, you do have to have a sense of humor about the way the world works to a certain degree otherwise you know you know you either laugh or you cry, cry yeah um <laughs> I, you know one of the things the one of the one of the things that came to me as i was reading this work and kind of like going over it for the third or fourth time was this idea of american messiness mm -hmm. i'm not sure if that if that resonates with you at all <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, you know, I think even just if you want to look at the last four years, you know, my disenchantment with my country, you know, but it, I always had it, you know, I think, um, 
Um, but really the last four, it did change. Something in me was like, I'm kind of done. Like, I don't know if I want to live here anymore. You know what I mean? Like I, I was thinking actively about like, who can I marry in Ireland? Or, you know, like, <laughs> um, not really, but you know, um, I think a lot of us, you know, when you see what happened in like Charlottesville or, you know, this is stuff that's like really scary. And I grew up in the American South. I know about all you know all the bad stuff like I've known ever since I was a kid I grew up in New Orleans which you know very impoverished city with a lot of problems and it's also one of the most like romantic and beautiful places in the world but it's just like a place that has a lot of issues that like I recognized as a young person you know as you know and I think you know my mother who was like a she was like a public school teacher in New Orleans recognized you know it was something that was inactive in my household I think to sort of just like recognize that there was like shit really wrong with you know the way things were you know mm -hmm. like I went to I went to public schools in New Orleans they were horrible I mean you know it was like we had no resources when I think about like I went to schools with no air conditioning you know like in a really hot city you know yeah. books were 15 years old you know just like that kind of stuff and it's just like somebody's fleecing somebody you know it's cap capitalism you know is like mm -hmm. a bad thing you know so anyway um yeah so america what did you say there was a certain phrase american american messiness yeah <laughs> and it's messy you know i think i get into that a little bit with like talking about nina simone and talking about um anita o'day and like junkies and like uh, you know i love that the thing that like nina says you know like i'm just another american junkie you know like in her own about her own you know country you know like mm. she never she knew that she had to leave america you know it was like it was never going to be okay here for her you know this place has a very dark history we know you know it's like it's it's been that way forever you know so, yeah yeah absolutely um, the uh it's interesting reading this book for me because as as you talked about before we got on started recording that uh you and i've never met but you've had a very long relationship in terms of like critic and artist. You send me your work. I write about your work and, you know, send brief emails about thank you for writing about my work and then kind of move on from there. But the conversation is in the criticism and the art itself. Yeah. And it's fascinating to see this is like, this is, um, this is your longest sustained single story. Yeah. Um, most everything you've done has been one pages, four pages. So, I'm interested beyond kind of like um, COVID, what was the, the impetus for this? Mm. And, and also um, I see it as a continuation of kind of like the things you've done before. And that Alex talked about like American messiness. It's like when I first started reading your, your comics, I was struck by, I was like, I can't figure out how old she is. Mm. It's mm -hmm. like, is she like, 80 years old and like new William S. Burroughs mm -hmm. and like hung out on the streets or is this like a 20 year old yeah. who's like, you know, living this really intense life. I, I couldn't quite figure it out. And I, I like that quality, this kind of like, uh, I'm uh, 16. Th uh, there you go. 16, this yeah. kind of, this I've like been writing for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, glad, out, yeah. I'm no. glad it's aging you in reverse. That's yeah. Yeah. No, I was born in 1975. I'm, 45 years old um I think I have a kind of youthful appearance because like people are constantly like no you're not that old you know but um I'm pretty old so. um but yeah so like uh, your <laughs> one of the running themes is like American like transients mm -hmm. and like there's a there's an essence of like it's it's in it's not just in your drawings but in and it's you know I would you know I definitely consider your work comics and it's a category I call comics as poetry, mm. which I differentiate it from poetry comics because sometimes there's a poem and then someone has a drawing that it, that's done with it and they're not necessarily working in conjunction with each other. Comics as poetry, the image and the words, um, as Alex said, work together. Yeah. And more to the point, your hand lettering is part of the art. It's part mm. of the aesthetic. Yeah. And, and it's got this like it's got the same beautifully grimy quality to it that I associate with your art. Like someone left this zine around and it's been laying around for 10 years and I discovered it somewhere. And it's like telling the truth about these like kind of squalid, but beautiful places. 
And um, so I guess two questions I'm asking, there are actual questions to here is the, <laughs> the impetus for this longer work and mm -hmm. also uh, something you even touched on earlier about like the dark history of the country, um, that balance between ugliness and beautiful in America and the places that you've been and mm -hmm. why that's important to you. Hmm. Um, uh, okay, uh, dark grimy quality. Want me to tackle that one first? No. Um, you know, I the things that influenced me in my life or that I find beautiful, when I, I think about certain films or, you know, have you ever seen like um, uh, John Huston's Fat City? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's like a sick, crazy movie. It's like, you know, I've always been sort of drawn to Skid Row or to, you know, just sort of like um, people that are like, I mean, it, it's not, it's, um, I don't know, like um, people in the hollers of Kentucky, you know, like just people that have like worked really hard or like have faded dreams or, you know, the Bowery, you know, like I've always just found that stuff interesting. Um, I don't know why it's just sort of, I mean, it is part of the American story that like, there's a lot of homeless people. There's people that drift around, there's hobos, you know, that, you know, people, you know, it's like, we're going to have like another depression probably, you know, but this sort of post COVID thing where like, you know, guys are hopping trains again, looking for work, you know, like, it'll, you know, I just think like, these are interesting parts of American history, you know? Um, what was the second element of that question? Um, sort of your impetus going from oh. short story and that process I'm kind of interested because it's such a beautiful stream of consciousness from like uh and it has the it even has like the qualities of like improvisational comedy and that you establish a theme early on and then there are frequent callbacks to it so like <laughs> Francis Bacon is kind of like your idea and like you go there you go in various directions you come back to him you loop around um, and so it's got that kind of structure and it has the playfulness and like wordplay of like, in some places, like a Marx Brothers film. Well, I love the Marx Brothers. That's like my favorite, like date, date night or something, <laughs> you know, it's just not, not like, doesn't make you very popular with girls, you know? <laughs> you know? But, um, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the Marx Brothers to me, it's some of the funniest stuff ever. You know, I just like, I love. I love them so much. I've I, I've drawn. I have a nice drawing I did of Chico many years ago, um, when he like you know shoots the keys on the piano, and um, you know I read a lot. Of, I went through like a a big period with the Marx Brothers, like reading books about them and like going going deep and hard into it. I, there was a really good Groucho bio that I read. Um, so I love, I love that kind of humor. And, you know, of course, Groucho, his stuff is very dark, actually, you know, he, his, his humor is very mean and, 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 um, you know, he lost all, a lot of money in the stock market crash, you know, and he lost relatives in Europe during the Holocaust, you know, like, I mean, this, you know, you, you see where it all comes from, you know? Um, Yeah. I, uh, wait, what was the other one? I'm sorry, I keep losing the thread. I'm like going off on the March Brothers now. Happily, I, I'm here to catch it. No, no, I know. <laughs> Show it back in for I you. I need to like take a note when I when you ask me the question though. No. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. It's uh, uh, putting this together as a long narrative as opposed oh, yeah, to- yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, I'll tell you, this was all very practical. Like I really just started to feel like having, you know, literally I'm drawing on like, you know, just letter, like copy paper, you know, that's what I generally draw on. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, trying to put like four or six, nine, whatever panels on this and drawing so small, I, I thought, I'm really not making this easy for people. And I wondered why, you know, I was like, why do I make it so difficult for somebody to dive into my work, you know? So I just started to like, I mean, I'd had this format, my like whole art career, right, you know, until like I did Francis Bacon and I was like I'm gonna change it up so make it something that's like you know digest size with like one image that's big I'm gonna draw a big picture I mean this is not a big picture but for me this is a big picture you know and uh, make the the you know you know sometimes like the lettering is very maniacal looking and like harder you know and if it's really tiny it's hard to read so and I found myself just like trying to you know 
use whiteout and fix lettering that was so tiny and stuff. So it was really just like, this also like looks better on the web, you know, like I can take one of these images and show it on the web. Like for example, that I was the comics I had on bomb, you know, I thought this is hard for people to read. They're having to kind of scroll one image, you know? So um, I was thinking more in this sort of, you know, like a, each, each image is like its own little diorama kind of style. I did find the, the lettering especially striking. I like every, every single letter was um, constructed in such an unconventional way. Mm -hmm. I found it, it, they, they were almost reminiscent of, I don't know, kanji. Mm -hmm. it, it gave me that vibe. Yeah. Interesting. And I, I, I yeah. found that re really engaging actually and, and really yeah. fascinating. Like it, was it was almost like I was. Oh no, continue. It, it was almost like I, I was translating like an ancient script. <laughs> That, that only I, I knew, like it, it, it gave me this very intimate sense of, of having discovered something. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it feels like an artifact. Like I said, something, yeah. like I said, something you found in some obscure place wasn't supposed to be there. Mm. And it's like, what is this thing I have found? Exactly. Yeah. It has that mm -hmm. vibe. Exactly. Yeah. Even writing like poems or, you know, I just love to write things out, you know, and I, right. and even just writing poems or whatever I just like to write it out versus like typing it out on a computer in general or I do like morning free writes and I really just like and I have like you know brush pens and they just look good you know were, were and, you using a brush pen for this uh yeah yeah, yeah. generally some pages I'm see I see I'm using a different pen and like the text looks a little different I wasn't like you know I'm not really rigid about what I do you know like I'm not like this is the pen I use I kind of will use whatever's <laughs> around I don't care too much about smudges or mistakes and stuff like that. And especially with this book, it felt, it felt okay to be a little like grimy with it. You know, it's kind of, right. it's like skipping all through time and the world. And, you know, it's like a world traveler kind of book or something. Well, even know. better to be a little grimy with it in this case. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I'd love to hear about your process, actually. Is it, did you, did you write this all out first um, and then decide the images or, or? So I had kind of written like, um, actually, you know, I, I, I was saying I like to write things out longhand, but I do use my notes app a lot, um, my, you know, on my Mac and stuff. It's kind of become the place to save everything and all my thoughts. But um, it kind of started off as a, a poem of maybe like, I don't know, 12 stanzas or something, you know, four line stanzas, which is kind of how I start anything I I that becomes a comic it's sort of I'm thinking about a panel and I'm thinking about you know and I'm just kind of going and then sometimes I'm counting and I'll have like 13 stanzas and it's going to be a 12 paneled comic and then I'm like I'm going to take one of these out I gotta fit you know like it's that kind of style I want it to fit into the comic form versus the other way around you know and uh, but I always start with the writing the writing super important and then the writing really does inform the image you know how what's what's funny to bounce off of this or you know am I just going to be illustrating something that's sort of an interesting thing to illustrate that I've referenced in that you know writing that text am I gonna take it someplace that like is a touchstone for the reader you know that like we both know oh oh yeah I like seeing that next to this you know like that's kind of like my favorite thing to do is sort of like I really like connecting with the reader so it's like what image is like universal that we're all like and I think good poetry does that you know it's like I mean you can you know whatever's being described it's like if it's done in this like way that like everybody's like oh, I know what that is you know there's an there's like a page in the book that a lot of people have brought up to me and when I wrote it felt like a particular coup in my own brain I was like oh this is a good page which is like the soaps in the, in my mother's bathroom page like a lot of people are like I know this basket of soaps you know like this is Everybody knows somebody who had it, you know, grand grandmother or whatever, you know. And, yeah, uh, I've I've seen those same desiccated soaps, the ones that no one wants to use. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I, you're that, just like you're not supposed to, you know. You may need yeah. soap, but you're and like the ones that are all splintering. Yeah, and like ancient. yeah, yeah. yeah they they're like <laughs> ancient, you know. So, um, that's like the kind of image I'm going for, though. You know what I mean? Like generally, I'm always trying to do something like that, and then sometimes it's just something personal, like. There, I don't know, there's like panels in that book where I'm talking about like, um, what's his name? Paul Morphy, who was like a, a chess master, you know, that I've read a book on and I just kind of got really into him. And like, maybe because he seems like he might've been like 
gay you know there's just like a lot of mystery around him in general because he's and he retired young and, and he was kind of turned into a nut like you know at the end of his life just like a weird dandy who and then he did i think drown in the tub or something you know so like jim morrison but anyway um stuff like that just feels like i'm indulging something you know my own my own like fascination and maybe you'll find it fascinating you know i hope you do or it makes you want to look at look it up but a lot of people have said you know i didn't know what you were referring to on this page but i just kept going you know and i said yeah you don't need to like linger and be like i don't know what this is about because the next panel is going to be different <laughs> it's not going to be like it's not going to be building much on that thing you know or it will but it's like in a way that's subliminal enough that you can just kind of bump along you know you it's the, the, the writing first and then do you do you work a number of drafts on the writing and then yeah so with this book the it, illustration yeah with this book i was doing something pretty stupid i was like really writing it out longhand like i had a i don't know I, I put an image on instagram but i had like stacks and stacks of paper like that I, I wasn't using or I'd start editing on it. And I was just, I did really write this book out a lot, you know, like many, many, many pages. I can show you, there's a little stack. <laughs> this isn't, yeah, it isn't all of it, you know, but it's like, you know, there's like, you know, like I, I write it all out. And um, this is, I threw a bunch out because I was like, I can't keep these, you know? Anyway, um, I kind of wish I had them all now, but it was, you know, just changing little phrases. So this book, I feel like I really worked on the writing very hard. And like, I think we all know, you know, when you write a college paper or something and you're like, I wrote a really good college paper, you know, like, you know, when you gave it your all and there's no, you know, point where you were just kind of like calling it in, you know, and I kept with this book, just like pushing it, you know, if there's some little point of it in my language that I was just like, oh, that could be better. I just worked on it, worked on it until I got it. I wanted it. So I, I, I can honestly say with this book, there's no point where I'm like, oh God, I wish, you know, because you always, you know, whatever it is, it's your, your, your comics, you, whatever you make, you know, where you, you're like, I just, I wish I'd figured out what the best, you know, piece is here, you know, it's really hard to do that. I mean, sometimes it takes years, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, people like trying to find the conclusion to their book or something. Like I, I messed around with the, the conclusion a lot, you know, I was like, I didn't know how it was going to end. I knew it was going to end with this weird wig image, but the way of like, you know, I don't have a wig at all or the last page, but I knew it was going to end with this sort of joke that like may not land with people or not. But then I started kind of filling it in beforehand and it all started really coming together. And then I brought in like the stuff with my dad, which wasn't even part of the original book, you know? And when I brought that in, it all made sense. Like my father, Francis Bacon, who's just a drunk himself, sort of like cruising down the streets, you know, it just all sort of came together in a way that, um, you know, it took a long time to kind of get there, you know, but. It, and, and that's exactly, I was sort of talking about the, this loose improvisational structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you start the book off by talking about someone said, I look like Francis Bacon. Yeah. And you're like, I sort of see it, but I'm better looking, which is, which is, you know, that's, that's a good gag to begin with. Yeah. And, then, and then you don't really think about that. But then by the time you arrive in the book, and this kind of like puts it of a kind with a lot of your other work, which so much of your work is about in the face of everything, in the face of America, of dark times, of dark places, there are people you meet their friends. And especially um, when you talk about in your book, um, meeting other queer people who mm -hmm. have been in like tough places and, you know, their families have rejected them. And you come to the end of the book and you're talking about your dad and you're talking about your friend, Joey Davis. Mm -hmm. And that was like, when you hit that resonant spot, it connected the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. it's Joey Davis, who said that you look like Francis Bacon. And then that was just such a beautifully emotionally resonant moment mm. that hits like so many of your other comics where you care so much about these people you've come across. And I see so much of your work as just being like little works of beauty about these beautiful people who brought something to your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of my writing is like me sort of just excavating my life and think people that were important to me, ep episodes of my life that were important to me. And like, if I haven't written about it yet, I will, you know, like, it's like, I think you kind of in the grand assessment of your life, which I think is like part of being, you know, part of like fulfilling, having a deeper having you know having a deeper meaning in life you know is sort of having to like really look inside you know and um some people do it some people try not to do it as hard as they can you know it's like they're, you know so many people don't want to look inside you know mm -hmm. and I think at some point I just realized I didn't have much of a choice in the matter and that I was like a creative person that was going to have to always sort of have some sort of outlet of you know like I, you know, they're talking about the sublimation thing again, but just sort of like, you know, I talk about it with Charlie Parker, so he had to blow the horn, you know, it's like, you just have to do this thing. And like, maybe your life is really hard. I mean, I feel like, you know, not to be all like blessed, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty blessed and pretty, you know, I feel like I've had a stability in my life, you know, that a lot of people don't that, uh, you know, really struggle making art you know it's the most some of the most brilliant people we know artists what you know musicians whatever you know have tragic lives you know and that I think the, this book addresses that a lot you know but um it's almost like a it's like it can be like this but it can also be like this there's all these good things too that like make life worth living you know I think that's like kind of always a theme in every one of the things I've ever written you know so and yeah. like, it was worth it just to have love. If, you know, if we, that one kiss you shared and you, you know, the, the firing squad shoots you right afterwards, or at least you had the kiss kind of thing. I do believe in that and fighting for good causes and all that other good shit. <laughs> so. It's interesting, Rob, you said um, that you, that in some ways you found the work improv improvisational. And I actually, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I basically completely disagree um, because what I really found, what it, to me, this feels like maybe um, uh, Francis Bacon feels like to me most is a quilt um, in the sense that each individual piece, if you will, each page is so intimately planned and constructed in the mm -hmm. sense that the language is so precise and the image is so precisely keyed off of that and each page may it may not seem like individually as you're moving from page to page flip to flip that it all kind of gels but then when you look at the whole thing when it's all stitched together you see the the intention of the creator of the thing um and so to me, as I was reading through it, I was like, this is like, this is like one of those really like you look, if you focus in on one page, you, you're not going to get the sense of the work that's being done here. But when you step back and look at it all as a, as a single thing, that's where you really see the beauty and kind of the, the, the breadth of it, because it is, this book really goes places. It really does. It, you know. <laughs> And um, so that's, that was my, my thought was this idea of like quilting this, um, which is, uh, which is well, something that I'm very familiar with coming from a a Appalachia. Uh huh. Yeah. I would say it's definitely quilted together. Um, things got moved around, you know what I mean? It, it's like the way that it ended up being structured. There was, there was a lot of me almost I did like insert things from other pieces of writing that were separate, you know, like I, I, I found things that fit to make the big picture, you know, that I thought the thread continued through, you know, it's a thin thread, you know, like, it's like, you might think you lost it, but it's there, you know, but um, yeah, I definitely did more like inserting than I normally do, but I, but it, it worked, you know, like I, normally I like it a little more organic and I think it was my intention. I mean, obviously I worked very hard on the structure and the writing and all of that. And you can see that it's like, you know, I don't think like that, you know, like in these lyrical, you know, ways like off the bat, but um, I was like, um, I had intentions, like li a literary intention with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, I was thinking about like William Blake and like songs of innocence and experiences. I was thinking about like something powerful, you know, like, and, 
not and and I've always been like so underground or whatever it's not like you know what I mean it was just like for me though it just felt like this is important like this is an important time to be putting something out in the world you know and um yeah well um I did want to clarify one thing when mm -hmm. I say improvisational people think of improv as like in, in comedy often is like short form improv which is like kind of impromptu word games little prompts things like that yeah I was, I was thinking more of what's called long term long form improv mm. which is um a deeper longer story structure that is often based on a single idea that be, is like kind of a recurring idea with the idea that there are like frequent callbacks to this idea throughout the work and that by the end you manage to sew the whole thing together to kind of create a whole mm -hmm. And, and yes, I mean, it was also very clear, like you said, that it was like, I, I think uh, Alex's quilt metaphor is a very um, uh, elegant one, because it works, it definitely works in that level as well, that like, you know, every quilt has its own, it's made of a bunch of individual squares. Um, and the decisions you make within each square uh, affect each individual square, but there is a larger structure that you're working on. Um, so I was actually, you know, you said that it was, do, do you actually, is what I saw in this kind of long form improvisational thing, a thing that was going through your mind or is this just the way I observed it? Well, I think like, I think I want it to feel improvised in a way. I mean, I think you want, I, I mean, that's, I think part of my intention. So I get that, like, you know, the idea of we're just kind of racing through here, you know? It's a little desperate. It's a little like, you know, you think about like a, you know, old noir, like DOA or whatever. And like the guy gets poisoned and he's got to find his killer, but you know, before he dies kind of style, it feels, I like that idea, you know, of like, you're kind of like racing along in this thing. And like, I mean, people have um, read it in one sitting, which I think is a good, good way to do it, you know, like just take it somewhere and just like, it's not that one. It's not going to like kill you to read it that, you know, fast, but um, like, you know, because um, but you were talking about that totality of the thing, you know, like when you're like, when you, you just put it all together, you know, you can maybe have a really powerful feeling afterwards. And I've been told that, you know, a lot of people really have been like, they're like, you know, blown away or something, you know, and I'm like, it's just like such a pleasing feeling for me because it's like, I feel, I feel like that's what I'm always sort of going for. You know, I want, I want you to like read it and be like, think about your life, you know, not think about how awesome I am or like I wrote a good book, but it's like, I really want you, you know, to be kind of like having like a really interior monologue about life or whatever, you know, afterwards, it's like, I want it to be thought provoking, you know? So, yeah. But I think not to a like, certain degree, like your language kind of spear to a certain degree, you're speaking. It feels like in this book, you're speaking both to yourself, but then also directly at the reader too. Like yeah. there's, it's a shared, there's a, it's a shared discussion like that, that you're directing the, the words at, at two distinct audiences at the same time. Yeah, no, I've said it feels like, it felt like my manifesto in some way, but it's also like a call to arms or something. And I think someone else was like, it's sort of like a self-help book or, you know, it's sort of, it's embracing a lot of different things, you know? And it's like, but I guess like one of the major themes of it is it's like, it's not about being conservative you know it's about sort of like live your life we might die any minute like you know it has this real like desperation so that might be another thing that sort of pushes it along in this harried way you know you're like it is you know it's a breakneck speed a little right you know i'm not like gonna like linger on any subject too long you know um i think at the end it slows down a little more maybe you know um you know, where like one subject covers a few pages or something or talking about my father or something, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think you, what you, struck me the most, oh, sorry, Daniel, go ahead. Were you, were you finding that this, that when you landed on a subject, that the subject kind of dictated the, the speed of the writing in terms of the way it is mm. expressed? Mm. You mean while I'm actually writing it? Yeah, like when you landed yeah. on your father, for example. Oh, sometimes I can't, like, oh. Well, sometimes it's like when I'm writing something, you know how it is. It's like when you're having a really good 
flow in your brain. It's almost like you can't write it fast enough, you know, like you're just like, you know, um, that happens sometimes, but, um, you know, I, you know, it's hard work. It, it's, I think like I have, I have, I've been doing this a while, you know, and it's like, I feel pretty confident in my voice, which is something that like a lot of people, writers don't feel, you know, and I, I don't know. I just have it. I don't know. I don't want to be like, I just got it, you know, but I've been doing this a while. It's like maybe hard earned, you know, and you have to like accept that that's something you earned. Right. Like I'm not good at being like, I'm so great. You know, like I'm pretty like, I don't, you know, like, anyway, I've been doing this a while. So it's like, my, my voice is confident. I, I trust what I'm going to say generally, you know, um, I don't like, you know, my books aren't edited by anybody. Like, I, I mean, I show it to my friends, but like Austin English doesn't edit my book, you know, like he publishes my book, you know, and he says, good book or, you know, but, um, you know, I think, um, I want to, you know, I don't want, it's it, being a writer, it's like requires, I think a lot of like really, you know, really looking in, into yourself and really practicing a lot, you know? And I've just been doing it for a long time. So it's like, I, I just trust my voice, you know? And like, I think that comes through in the, you know, when people are reading it, they're not gonna go, who is this clown, you know? So maybe that helps um, add to the power of it, you know? I'm, I'm actually really curious to, jump maybe way way back for a sec and, mm. and talk more about how as someone who as you've said has no formal background in art uh -huh. uh, how you made the jump from just doing you know poetry as is to so like yeah in the like late 90s um I think I like really started making comics in 99 you know I was working in cafes in New Orleans and we would like take the daily paper the strips in the daily paper and we'd like white out and like put different text in the um you know talk bubbles and stuff like that and then oh, that's cool yeah and I was writing a lot of poetry on the time I had a typewriter and I was just you know I'd go home it was like very like beat poet or something I'd go home and like type and smoke a joint or whatever and um then I just started to feel that I wanted um actually I had a friend who was doing these like beautiful like uh India ink journals, like just like, and, and making little zines and giving them out. Her name's Amy Moon. And she's a painter now that lives in, uh, I think she's in Santa Cruz. Um, really, really cool person. Also it's just a cool person that you were like, oh man, you listen to great music. You're like beautiful. You're like so fun to be around. And, um, but she, yeah, she was doing these really cool, very personal, beautiful comic things basically. I mean, it was an illustrated journal, but it was like scenes like set up like comics. And she was like, you need to do, you, you would do that. I think I had started doing it a little bit. She, she got me really into it, but the whole thing was wanting, wanting image. You know, I really wanted an image. I thought it would be, it's like, I wanted a more powerful form of poetry. And that's, I think where I was going from, but my early stuff was also really gaggy and very, you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was going for cheap thrills, you know, cheap laughs, you know, penises and, you know. <laughs> diseased penises you know I would just like go for whatever you know I don't know if it, my early stuff some of it's been collected and I'm like you know as you, you know how it is when you, you know it's like I'm better now <laughs> I'm better than that. that's all I can say but then some people really love that stuff too like it's like there is a there is like a you know it's the same thing actually it's just so it's very primitive you know but um there's heart the same heart to it you know it's not mean it's not you know it's not just gaggy there's always like a little seriousness going on mm. yeah I mean I'm I'm also like an adult you know like I'm not like a young person anymore you know so it's like I I, I feel like if I was making comics when I'm 80 it's like what am I going to be saying then you know like it's mm. like you know, I'm in my midlife crisis now like what's going to happen when you're like close to dying you know you're still pretty young I'm going to say Let's be real. But I don't know if you don't, I'm 45. If I double that by two, I have to live to 90 to be in my real midlife, which I don't, you know. But if we're comparing you to 80, you're, you're doing yeah, just fine. I know, I know. I, you know, I look young, sort of. I haven't had any Botox yet, but. <laughs> it's, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of your work in like the last five years has had that feeling of like, you're telling these stories of these things that happened to you a while ago. Yeah. 
like remember, you know, I was living here and I was doing this and I was having this memory and I'm thinking about this person and, um, and it adds a level of uh, emotional resonance to your work um, and kind of looking back and thinking about your past and throughout the book, you know, I mentioned there's this kind of free flowing quality to it. That's part, not quite stream of consciousness, but as, like I said, it's closer to like Marx brothers or will elder style wordplay. Mm -hmm. um, but then there'll be like, there'll be a joke and then you'll follow it up with something really beautiful and heartbreaking, like the phrase, sometimes I take more care in not trying to bruise a nectarine than being tender with myself. Mm -hmm. And you say that, and then you move on. And, you, when you, and like, instead of expounding more on that, you just move on. Yeah. And I was just like, that's just, you know, that made me feel deeply sad, but also <laughs> like, deeply i deeply empathize and understood mm. exactly what you meant mm -hmm. and, and there's that it's not just the thing about it is that it's not just a sad thing to say that's a moment of profound self-realization that mm. this is something that you do and that's a lot of what's kind of in this work is like this sort of um this is the work of someone who really understands where they've been where they are and maybe where they're going yeah, I also think that's a distinctly um, like a feminine feeling, you know, of sort of like when women take care of other people and not themselves, you know, so I think that's I, I feel that way. But um, yeah, I um, I mean, what more do you say after you say that? Like, where, what are you, how, you know, how am I going to expound on that? <laughs> you know, right? Like after you read it, you know, you see you move on. Yeah. And, and that's sort of the beauty of <clears throat> the poet poetry of it. Too, yeah. is that you have this very small line that is just so heavy and just so yeah. full that you don't need to go any further with it yeah and then and then because you don't go any further with it it just sort of lingers out there a little mm -hmm. bit and I really yeah. appreciate it yeah really yeah. appreciate it thank yeah. you thank you one of the things that really struck me you know my first read through of the book I was really kind of, I guess the best word is uh, flabbergasted. Da Daniel, yeah, I was chatting with Daniel. I'm like, what, what am I even, what am I even doing? What did I just read? I'm like, re and I'm reading it. And I'm like, and then I took a little time and I read the dedication at the end. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that really brought the whole book together in a way that I don't understand. I don't think I really fully understood the book until I read the dedication. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure okay. why I, I really cannot place why, like reading that piece very like intently was the thing that pulled it all together. But in that moment, I felt um, that it's such a, that I think that, you know, my ultimate final thought about uh, Francis Bacon is just this idea of this very humanist and, I, I I told uh, Daniel that this it, it, this uh, the writing is like the sound of the life of the mind mm. to me that this is you know that this is um, kind of a person who's spent a lot of time thinking about what you know how the world works and the difference between I guess um, information and wisdom right this uh, you know and it seems like a lot of the stuff in in this book is hard earned to a certain degree and so mm -hmm. there's there's this the, to me there's a there's this pull and 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 i think it finally crystallizes with that dedication for me was this oh this is this is where this is this is um this is why daniel's been pushing me to read this book now for six months this is you know this is what's going on so um yeah. so just an observation not even a question yeah no you know it's like um an elegy you know to a lot of people this book you know and then ending it you know it's very funny at the end of of it um this book was like originally like 32 pages and ended up being like 56 pages so that, that that's to say something about the patchwork thing again. And I just started like kept adding elements to it because um, it kept feeling richer and richer. And like, there was like just things that were 
But um, so when it was coming down to page count, I was having all this kind of trouble figuring out, like, am I going to do a title page? I always have issues with this and I struggle and I make like lots of title pages and lots of other stuff. And then I just, but anyway, you know, I decided with that title page, you know, which is like a bunch of fake index thing and so, not index, but a table of contents. And, and at the end, I wanted to have some fake ads, you know, for catheters, like my brand of catheters I'm selling. If you guys, I don't know, if any, does anybody need any catheters? Because I've got several. I'm good, thanks. So, <laughs> I haven't sold All any set. yet. I haven't sold, not a, not a pair, nothing. Um, no, but um, I, I, anyway, I, I knew I was going to have this page and I had written a kind of longer thing about my friend, Sarah, who had passed away. And I just knew I was going to put it in there. I mean, she was like a sister to me, an old friend of mine. And she, you know, issues with drugs. And so the person you're always kind of worried is going to die that is in your life. And I think it felt appropriate to put it in there and to sort of pay homage to her and talk to her a little bit. And she was someone, you know, I do talk, like I think Rob was saying a lot about the past, you know, it's like, I'm kind of just like working through my twenties lately, you know, and I'm, you know, it's like, I think it takes that amount of time maybe to sort of evaluate what happened five, 10, 20 years ago, you know? And I love talking about my twenties because it was a cool time. And I moved to New York city in my twenties. I, you know, that was just like, you know, your first five years in New York can be really exciting. And um, there's just things I remember that need to be talked about. And that's kind of how it all ends up in, in books eventually, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that was important. The dedication, I think it, it felt like it worked with all the other material. It's, just, it's a separate thing in a different universe, but it fit, you know, and again, sort of in the spirit of like, you have this very powerful dedication, then you have these ridiculous fake ads. And then the, I can't let this go without talking about the back cover, which <laughs> beyond like um, the bits from like uh, the Fat Albert kids yeah. and Andy Cap, uh, the fact that you label this book subject wise as erotica. Uh -huh. It's like such a profoundly amazing gag. <laughs> uh, it's not expounded upon at all. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, it's like, it, the funny thing about it is that that's even kind of a funny word in itself. Yeah. Like, what is erotica exactly? Is it classy porn? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and, and that, that kind of like plays into like, the what is it nature of this book mm -hmm. uh, in, in a funny way. Was that just, for you just like a throwaway gag or is like a very deliberate like? No, just a kind of, I just thought it would be funny. I think I was looking at like old paperbacks and stuff and just like, you know, I, this is, I have a lot of books, my, you know, that I just sort of look at and sometimes I kind of will steal a little bit of design element. And I think I was probably looking at some, you know, gay erotica, you know, little cheapo paperback or something. And I thought that would be funny. I mean, it is erotica. I mean, it's whatever you want it to be, but I think, you know, there's some erotica going on in there. Sure. It's yeah. just, it's, it's, mo it's just mostly emotional. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I love that. Like the best stuff is. Yeah. Indeed. Well, I think that is probably a great opportunity or a great stopping point for us today all right um, Ooh. you've all been listening to enemies of the state i'm alex hoffman the publisher of solrad i'm daniel Elkin, editor chief of solrad i'm rob clow acquisitions editor of solrad i'm jules bakes freelance critic and we've been talking to elizabeth bethea about francis bacon published by domino books in 2021 and on the ignat slate so we'll see how that all ends up and uh and we're recording this a little bit ahead of when those results come come out. But Elizabeth, we wish you the best. This Thank has been you. an amazing conversation. Uh, it's Thank been you so, fun so talking much. to you guys. Thank you. I have one correction, which is my last name is Bethay. Bethay. My yeah. my apologies. My apologies. No, no, it's just fine. And uh, yeah, I, my nom de plume is E.A. Bethay, but my first name actually is Elizabeth. Yeah. So <laughs> if anybody's confused. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. And thank you. Real pleasure.